The Ermac Center is proud to present the SFU Fellows of the Royal Society of Canada Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts five presentations per semester. For the spring 2012 semester, the presenters belong to the Departments of Earth Sciences, English, Biological Sciences, Economics, and the School of Resource and Environmental Management. Today's speaker is Dr. Carol Gerson from the Department of English. Dear colleagues, I have to put my glass on. Thank you, Dr. Jungis, Jungik, sorry, for having welcomed SFU fellows of the Royal Society of Canada to share their research with the academic community in this stimulating interdisciplinary seminar series showcase, showcased at the Earmark Center. This activity demonstrates that through the diversity of the research fields, there are common qualities which, researcher, which, which tie researchers, creativity, innovation, audacity, and determination. This wonderful initiative happens at the beginning of a very special year for the Royal Society of Canada. 2012 is the 130th anniversary of the institution, created in 1882 by the, by the 37 year old Governor General of Canada, the Marquis of Lorne. The highlight of the celebration will be the annual general meeting in November 16 to 19 in Ottawa. Some very interesting events are planned during the weekend. The annual symposium organized this year by the Academy of Science, the induction of new uh, RSC fellows, an award ceremony, a banquet, the AGM itself, and other gatherings. Fellow will be also invited to visit the first permanent home for the RSC called Walter House, an heritage house very well located in Ottawa on Somers Somerset Street. I don't know if uh, you know the place, but it's very well located between uh, Metcalf Street and O'Connor Street. I hope that many SFU fellows of the RSC will be present to participate in the renewal of this 130th old organization devoted to the culture of knowledge, the recognition and the promotion of intellectual, artistic and scientific achievements of outstanding scholars, creators and innovators for the benefit of Canadian. In the context of this anniversary year, please allow me to conclude with a wish. SFU has an art gallery an unique multidisciplinary school of arts. I saw on Hastings Street the Center of, of Arts. As an institutional member of the RSC, SFU has the privilege of nominating potential fellows. Of course, the 40 uh, individual SFU fellows of the RSC can also nominate. Most of the time, Artists, musicians, painters, sculptors, dancers, singers, actors, writers, filmmakers, and others are not part of the academic community. But they can be nominated by RSC institutional members and individual, individual fellow. In 2005, specific arts division, we call it number three in, a, in the Academy of Arts and Humanities, has been created. It has a very young history. The Royal Society of Canada needs more new fellows from the artistic field. I would like to see more outstanding artists being nominated in 2012. I wish 
to hear from SFU, nous sommes prêts to make it, it happen. Thank you very much. And we'll listen to Carol. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to invite Professor Betty Schoenberg to introduce our sp today's speaker. Thank you for this invitation to introduce Dr. Carol Gerson to you today. Uh, during the nearly 35 years since she completed her PhD in UBC in 1977, Carol has taught, researched, and published primarily in early Canadian literature with a focus on pre-1920 writing, also on women writers and the history of the book. These three themes unite her latest book, uh, Canadian Women in Print, 1750 to 1918, which was published in 2010. This book won the Gabriel Roy Prize for Canadian criticism given annually by the Association of Canadian and Quebec Literatures. With consistent shirk support, she has maintained a busy research and publication schedule that has occasionally involved substantial team effort, most notably with the $2.3 million award-winning project on the history of the book in Canada, funded by Shirk and MCRI. Her substantial publication list includes some 10 books, more than 70 book chapters and journal articles, and many book reviews, entries in re reference books, and newsletter contributions. She's currently involved in a groundbreaking digital initiative, the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory, um, catchily named Quirk, I think, uh, housed at the University of Alberta, which has received CFI funding and for which she is updating and expanding her bibliographical database on early Canadian women writers. Carol is very committed to the training and mentoring of the next generation of scholars, graduate students and postdoctoral scholars, to whom she directs most of her research funding and who benefit enormously from the opportunity to work with the leading scholar in her field. As Carol's colleague for 20 years, often as a fellow committee member or administrator, I want to emphasize also Carol's leadership role in our department and beyond. In addition to her substantial administrative contribution with terms as undergraduate chair, graduate chair, and department chair, that's kind of a short list of the worst jobs in the department, uh, she leads by example as a department citizen. I wouldn't be surprised if she holds the long-term attendance record at department meetings, colloquia, and social events, not to mention graciously hosting many of the latter. Her generosity to colleagues across the spectrum of specialties is truly remarkable, as is her active mentoring of junior faculty in our department. Carol has also served on Senate and on a number of university committees, including search committees for senior administrators, and on committees beyond the university for SHRC, the Canada Council's Killam program, from which she has also held an award, and of course, the Royal Society of Canada. Carol is truly an example of the engaged scholar, both within academia and in the wider community. I could say much more, but I was asked to keep this brief. And so I will conclude by welcoming Carol, who will be speaking on a subject that reflects her sharing of her research expertise with the wider community. The title of her talk today is Plaques and Persons Commemorating Canada's Authors. <laughs> The mic in the right place. Okay, thank you. Well, maybe I should just go home while well, I'm ahead <laughs> after Betty's wonderful introduction. So I'm essentially going to read this because it's faster than speaking, more compact than speaking. Um, so there, there are many ways for fans to connect physically with their favorite writers. This comes out of my sort of long-term interest in the way um, and so the public response to literature, and, um, and I've done work on Pauline Johnson and Ella Montgomery, and this kind of pulls together some of those threads uh, from over the years. Um, and I'd really like to thank uh, Ermax and, and for putting on this series so that I can talk further about some of the things that are a lot of fun to do. Um, so there are many ways for fans to connect physically with their favorite writers. A collect the collection of autographs has been a long-standing practice, as has the collection of an author's books. Other dedicated readers like to visit the sites of favorite stories or poems or view treasured artifacts in museums. 
Fandom merges with higher levels of significance when governments participate in cultural recognition by designating writers' homes as historic sites or by formally commemorating authors' achievements with the unveiling of official plaques. Few objects can have a stronger material presence than an historic plaque, a solid black brass rectangle, you'll see a few of these, fixed to a building or a sturdy stone cairn whose words and images will endure through time and weather in a meeting of national and cultural interests that transforms undifferentiated landscapes into places with specific stories to tell. Such recognition of writers varies notably, varies notably from one country to another, signaling, signaling the importance granted to literature and its creators in shaping a nation's self-image. The construction of an historically based national literary identity takes different forms, from the expectation that every citizen will be familiar with a canonical text, such as Tom Sawyer or Hamlet, to the sanctification of a writer's personal existence and its associated materiality from birthplaces to grave sites. In Ireland, for example, a good portion of the tourist industry focuses on the country's literary heritage, directing visitors to the Writers Museum in Dublin and landmarks such as Yates Tower in Co County Galway and Joyce's Martello um, Tower in Sandy Cove. They seem to like towers. Um, England's long tradition of literary tourism has produced many published guides to the London of Dickens and of Sherlock Holmes, to Hardy's Wessex, to Bronte Country, and I especially like a gu guidebook I found um, from 1943, a literary journey through wartime Britain with photos of bomb damage to many hallowed sites. In other countries, things are more institutionalized. In Spain and France, literary tourism is now supported by federal ministries of culture. The website for Spain li li links 50 writers' houses, while France's Fédération des Maisons d'Écrivains et des Patrimoines Littéraires includes 347 literary museums, the last time I looked, and offers tour itineraries and school programs. In the US, there are national guidebooks as well as localized guides to literary sites in the Midwest, Boston, and New York. And there's one from New York, uh, New York Literary Sites dated 1903. Um, evidence of the rise in academic interest includes a recent call for contributions to an anthology on American literary tourism. The topic moved into the realm of parody when Mary Ann Levine's reverential guide to writers' homes in New England, this was first published in 1984, inspired a brilliantly titled but otherwise disappointing novel called An Arsonist's Guide to Writers' Homes in New England. It's by um, Brooke Clark, Brock Clark. And this was followed by a study that came out last year by Anne Trubeck called A Skeptic's Guide to Writers' Houses. So where does Canada fit into all this um, commemoration? Um, in 1908, there was an article on Canadian literary homes, but little followed that I found until the 1980s, when there was a, a rise of literary nationalism. We had got John Robert Colombo's Canadian Literary Landmarks, the Oxford Illustrated Guide to Canada by the Moritzes, and more specific literary guides to Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, and Winnipeg. In 1998, Denise Perrouse published P. Littéraire du Québec. All these volumes combine actual and fictional geographies, identifying both the places where writers lived and the settings of their writings. Literary interests turned more literal in the recent campaigns to preserve Alperti's house in um, Amelia's, Amelia'sburg, Ontario, and Joy Kagawa's house, childhood home here in Vancouver, which is being uh, turned into a writer's retreat. But these efforts seem to be relatively rare blips in an otherwise subdued cultural nationalism, which pays substantial attention to writers when they're alive, but with the exception of popular figures like Ella Montgomery, does surprisingly little to remember them in a material fashion once they're gone. So the noted American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow offers an opportunity to differentiate between what David Bentley terms the literary sight piece, which is the literary evocation of a specific landscape in the fashion of the great English romantic poets, and current literary tourism, which is less about the writer's work than about the celebrity of the author. Longfellow's popular long narrative poem, Evangeline, from 1847, is a grand literary sight piece in the Romantic tradition, whose influence in constructing a cultural identity for Nova Scotia led to, quote, the wholesale reorganization of an actual landscape in order to make it conform to a best-selling historical romance, in the words of historians Ian Mackay and Robin Bates. The story of Evangeline has to do with a pair of lovers who are separated during the expulsion, and, and she spends her whole life looking, uh, Evangeline spends her whole life looking for her Gabrielle, and they're finally united at the end, and very tearfully. It's very, very sentimental. But um, Longfellow himself had no direct connection with Nova Scotia. He never set foot in the place. 
They heard the story that generated the poem from a visitor or, in th or from ha Nathaniel Hawthorne, the different stories about the origin. And as an historical figure, L Longfellow is commemorated in two American sites, with, which, are, which have their own layers of significance. There's the Wadsworth Longfellow House in Portland, Maine, which is the home of his grandfather, where he spent most of his childhood. And that's been open to the public since 1901. And there's the Longfellow National Historic Site in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the stately house where he resided for 40 years. In Nova Scotia, there was no such material foundation for Longfellow's sanctif sanctification. Yet, since um, the late 19th century, courtesy of Longfellow, the province's tourism has benefited from its fabricated identity as the land of Evangeline. But the commemoration of a fictional heroine at the real locale of Grand Prix National Historic Site, where the Acadians lived before they were kicked out, has, and, and it has enough, there's an awful lot of archaeological work going on there. The, the conflict between the, the, the um, fictional Evangeline and the real history of the Acadians has um, generated a lot of controversy, as you can imagine. And the most real recent analysis of this is in uh, Ian McKay and Robin Bates' book that I just quoted from, titled In the Province of History, The Making of the Public Past in Nova Scotia. In the 1960s and 1970s, when Prince Edward Island similarly chose to rescue its economy by focusing on a fictional character to en enhance its tourist appeal, they were fortunate to have Ella Montgomery's Anne, of Green Anne Shirley of Green Gables, who was actually properly located in um, in um, Prince Edward Island. There are controversies surrounding that, but at least the, there, there are, there's geographic and historic authenticity to justify um, that, that whole industry that's grown up around Anne. So, in Canada, the creation of public memory through the more official means, through the official means, through the mounting of commemorative plaques and the preservation of historic sites, including some writers' houses, falls under an assortment of jurisdictions. At the federal level, we have the Historic Sites and Monuments Board. Well, at the provincial level, there are various departments in each province of heritage or historical boards and other organizations, and often their titles and mandates change. At the local level, we can find foundations and associations dedicated to specific writers, regions, or sites. It's a real mishmash. Occasionally, municipal agencies are involved. Um, for example, this is Benares, the elegant home that served as the model for, for Maison de la Roche's Jalna, um, where she set all her popular novels that were that were really that were bestsellers um, in the early years of the 20th century. It is now a museum operated by the city of Mississauga. Um, in Ottawa, the Green Space Alliance is working on the creation of a poet's pathway, poet's park, and poet's hill to mark the city's many historic literary affiliations. A different project is um, because it focuses largely on current writers, recent writers, is the charitable foundation of uh, project bookmark. Um, they haven't done a lot of them. I think that's the most recent one I could find. But they envision an ambitious national program of plaques that link literary texts with the sites that they embody. It's impossible to track all of these down, although the web makes it easier to try. Um, fortunately for me, there's an enterprising retired teacher in Ontario who's created two fabulous websites, one for historical plaques in just Toronto, and as of the middle of January, there are 847. And another for historical plaques in Ontario, other than Toronto, and as of the middle of January, there are over 1,400. Um, and they're helpfully indexed, and that's where I've got some of the pictures that I'm going to be showing you. So these efforts then, the various efforts, confirm that commemoration is erratic and unpredictable. Um, for example, the long and wide-ranging career of poet Charles Mayer, whose name is preserved in the town of Mayer, Saskatchewan, has been recognized only with a federal plaque in the post office of his birthplace of Lanark, Ontario, and an Ontario plaque remembering the Canada First Movement, which he helped to found in 1868. That, that plaque is placed on the uh, wall of, outside wall of the National Club on Bay Street in Toronto. Other writers have received more substantial recognition. One such person is Isabella Valancy Crawford. Um, she was virtually ignored during her very brief life in the late latter part of the 19th century, but she's subsequently been noted in plaques from three levels of government. Uh, this one was mounted by the Toronto Historical Board in a park they named after her, um, which is near the house where she died in downtown Toronto. She, the address where she died is 57 John Street, but whatever was there was demolished long ago. It's now, the CBC is now on that site, and um, the park is built on, it's on Front Street, not very far away. For Crawford, there's also an undated earlier plaque in the town of Paisley, which is one of the places where she lived as a child, and that's from the Provincial Archaeological and Historic Sites Board, 
And in Peterborough, another place where she lived, there's a 1983 plaque from the Federal Historic Sites and Monuments Board following her designation as an historically important person in 1947. Each of these plaques does different cultural work, highlighting Crawford's association with the locale in which it appears. For example, the, the plaque in Peterborough does not mention anything about Paisley. And the Toronto plaque offers the most information about her writing. What's, what's interesting is if we go to Isabella Valencia Crawford, there's another plaque, and I wish I had a photo of it. I'm going to try to get one. And what it says is, this public park is made available to the residents of the City of Toronto by the Royal Bank of Canada, October 19th, 1987. Given the terrible poverty that Crawford endured, it is ironic that her commemorative park owes its existence to the corporate generosity of the bank whose headquarters rise up along its western border. And I have no documentation, but I surmise that, in fact, when the, uh, when the Royal Bank of Canada moved its headquarters from Montreal to Toronto in the late 1970s and built these massive towers, it was probably required to provide some green space. And uh, that's probably why um, they got involved in, in uh, making this park possible. Um, similar claims to um, cultural capital unite the three plaques, again, from three different levels of government that identify the Ontario residences of Ella Montgomery, this is apart from all the PEI stuff, um, author of Anne of Green Gables, who left PEI. She moved to Ontario after she married a Presbyterian minister who lived in, and they lived in several different towns in um, central Ontario. Um, so the most recently dedicated one is the, Ma is the Mance in Leeskdale, Ontario, where she lived, where she did a lot of writing actually from 1911 to 1926. And there, there are both, there are plaques from both the um, provincial archaeological, uh, Historic Sites and Monuments Board, as well as the Federal Historic Sites and Monuments Board. And Lease Dale Mance was designated a National Historic Site in 1996, and it got a plaque in 2008. Her last home at 210 Riverside Drive in Toronto is currently a private residence, but there's actually a plaque from the Toronto Historic Board in a nearby parquet. I don't think the people in the house want tourists coming up and taking pictures, but they're, they're, this site is, is commemorated if you know where to go for the little um, um, park. Um, and of course, there are a whole bunch of other Montgomery things going on. There's a former tourist home in Bala, Muskoka, where she spent a holiday in 1922, and that's now a private Montgomery museum. And this stands apart from all the multiple, um, the, from the multiple commemorations in Prince Edward Island, where history and fiction blend in an array of designations. So what hap what's happened in Prince Edward Island is that virtually anywhere where Ella Montgomery is known to have been is now designated an historic site. Um, so for example, um, she, she, when she was young, she taught in a, in a number of different rural schools. Um, Biddeford Parsonage, the parsonage in the town of Biddeford, where she boarded in, 19, in 1894 to 1895, is now a museum with a reconstructed mods room. And the school where she taught um, in Lower Bedeck in 1896-97 has been restored as a typical one-room schoolhouse, now officially named the Lucy Maud Montgomery Lower Bedeck School. And of course, far more problematic is the canonization of the fictional land, Shirley at Green Gables National Park in Cavendish. There's a ton of literature about that. And then there are a lot of private sites, um, because uh, some of the places that are supposed to be sites for her stories are in private hands. So all the writers I've mentioned have been recognized by the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, the HSMBC, whose official mandate is to designate, quote, national historic persons defined as, quote, people who have made an outstanding and lasting contribution to Canadian history. What I'd like to do now is consider further the writers who've been um, actually included in this sort of magisterial designation and the patterns of recognition that bring some authors into our national narrative and omit others. This project was inspired in part by my own participation in the process, and I'll get to that a little later. While one can easily get lost in the maze of provincial, local, and private recognitions of writers and their associated homes, birthplaces, teaching places, residences, places where they ate dinner, and other sites. The HSMBC, which is administered through Parks Canada, is relatively easy to navigate via Parks Canada's various websites. And actually, it's a Wikipedia site that's fabulous. Um, I don't know who maintains it, but you can sort things. It's much better than the Parks Canada site. And, it's, and, it's more, and it's, it, the updating is better than the Parks Canada site, too. So the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, HSMBC, was created in 1919 to advise the National Parks Branch and the Minister of the Interior on, quote, the selection, commemoration, and preservation of national historic sites. It was closely associated with the Canadian Historical Association, it still is. And the board's first members were mostly historians interested in Canada's military and fur trade past, or they were advocates of spe specific causes, 
such as recognition of the Loyalists. Most of their selected historic sites were located in Quebec and Ontario, and in fact, well, the bulk of them are located in Eastern Canada for obvious reasons, although there's an awful lot in New Brunswick as well. Limited racial and political ideologies prevailed as board members rejected proposals to commemorate sites important to the history of blacks, Jews, Mennonites, and Ukrainians. This was in the past. In 1937, the board added a program of secondary plaques, aimed in part at redressing regional and thematic imbalances by including political figures and the arts and letters. In the words of historian C.J. Taylor, author of the only full-length study of the HSNBC, quote, anyone of sufficient fame would be considered to be worthy of a secondary tablet, including provincial premiers, poets, painters, and popular novelists. The administration of National Historic Sites National Historic Sites remains under the jurisdiction of Parks Canada, whose website informs the public that, quote, Canada's program of historic commemoration recognizes nationally significant places, persons, and events of Canadian history, designation of national historic, designations of national historic significance are made by the Minister of the Environment on the advice of the Historic Sites and Monuments Board. It's a little redundant, but um, it's very clear how the process works. Um, so the first writer to be recognized was um, poet Archibald Lampman who was declared a nationally significant poet in 1920. And that's his cairn there. I want to get a better picture of it. You can actually see that it seems to have plaques. In fact, I want to, I want to go see it. I got this off the website. I think it's got plaques on, on uh, I think it's got multiple plaques on different sides. Um, so Archibald Lampman was the first uh, nationally significant, the first poet to be declared an, an important person to be plaqued by the HSNBC. And this was in 1920. Um, Few other writers, however, uh, were honored until the late 1930s, when there was a wave of writers being recognized after this change in policy. Those canonized between 1936 and 1939 were all men, of course, many of whom were well known for their professional activities as historians, journalists, or educators. As, as this isn't an audience of specialists in early Canadian literature, I won't bore you by reciting all the names, but at least there were at least a dozen English writers and, and four French writers. Or, or men who were known for their writing as well as for their other uh, public, uh, other features of their public life. This wave of cultural interest in the 1930s also brought forward the first culturally active woman deemed to be of national historic significance. And this was singer Emma Albany. She was designated in 1937, and she was only the second woman in the entire list of nationally sig significant people. The first was Madeleine de Verchere, who was recognized in 1923, and there's a whole cult around Madeleine de Verchere. As, um, the next wave of writers occurred in the mid, from the mid-40s to 1951, and this included the 1943 designation of Ella Montgomery, who was the first female writer to be recognized. A few, a few uh, names from this era might be familiar to some of you. Poet Bliss Carmen, Pauline Johnson, who's actually buried in Stanley Park. William Kirby, author of The Golden Dog, Stephen Leacock, humorist. John McRae, author of In Flanders Field, the poem everybody recites around the world without knowing it's Canadian. Um, Marshall Saunders, author of, the, uh, author of Beautiful Joe, novel about a, an abused dog, and poet Isabella Valencia Crawford, whom I talked about earlier. Um, the addition of these names during the 1940s wasn't accidental. It coincided with interest, the interest in fostering Canadian culture that underpinned the Royal Commission on National Development in the Arts, Letters, and Sciences, known as the Massey Commission. So there was a definite coincidence here. Because during the 1950s and 1960s, writers all but vanished from the list of new designations until the cultural nationalism of the mid-1970s initiated a fresh phase that included a number of uh, familiar names, writers Emile Nelligan, Aubert de Gaspé, poet E.J. Pratt, Susanna Moody, Catherine Partrail, Goldwyn Smith, and I'm naming him because he, he's got a, nice, got a nice shot there of his plaque, um, Margaret Dooley and Maisel de la Roche. Um, his plaque, uh, is here. It's on the grounds of the Grange. Um, those of you who know Toronto know that it's at the, this, his residence is now part of the Art Gallery of Ontario, um, and uh, it's it's an, it's a very nicely preserved, stately historical site. Needless to say, he didn't lack money to uh, live in a place like that, um, unlike poor Isabella Valancy Crawford. Um, so some writers' plaques, like Goldwyn Smith, have been placed on the grounds of former residences. Others, where the residences don't exist, or for other, you know, for other reasons, others are placed in schools, churches, libraries, parks, and post offices, federal property. I guess that's why post offices, because at least they were federal property. I have no idea who owns post offices now. A rare multiple plaque at the University of New Brunswick is titled Poets' Corner. It honors three poets, from uh, three nationally historic people who were poets, 
as, who are known as poets who were students together at the University of New Brunswick in the early 1860s. And these are actually two earlier plaques. The current plaque, is, it's been, there's yet another replacement plaque that's a bilingual plaque, because all the plaques are now bilingual. And it's part of a really nice monument outside the Harriet Irving Library um, with a bench. And you can sit there and sort of you know, commune with the poets if you'd like. Um, but not, not all national historic persons actually receive plaques. Um, for example, there's no plaque for Sir John Franklin because nobody knows where to put it, because the story of his demise in the Arctic is still unfolding and um, it's just being left. The fact that he's unplaqued means that he's associated with all sorts of sites where they, the remains could have ended up. So how does this happen? Um, well, some of these people were long dead when honored. Others, such as Ella Montgomery and Stephen Leacock, were recognized within a year or two of their deaths. Such immediacy has not been possible since the regulations were changed at some point during the 1980s to limit nominations to those who have been dead for at least 25 years. It's okay, I can get, pause for a drink. Surprising absences from the list of writers include Sarah Jeanette Duncan, uh, a novelist, Agnes Small McCarr, Marjorie Pickthall, a poet, Felicite Angers, Laura Conan is not a national historic person, and Laura Goodman Salverson to cite a few women writers, and there are also a few men you'd expect to see on the list. Why, one might ask, would Jean Blewett, a relatively obscure poet who was popular during the 1930s, be a national historic person, and not Sarah Jeanette Duncan, who is far more important as a writer and has received substantial attention since the 1960s? Well, it all has to do with, who, with people getting together to do the nominations. And uh, one of the members of the um, Historic Sites and Monuments Board in the 1930s was an historian from, these, from southern Ontario um, who presumably was part of the process of nominating Blewett, who, um, who resided in Chatham, Ontario. What's particularly interesting is the sparsity of Francophone women. There are very few Francophone women in the list of National Historic Persons. Marguerite Bourgeois, who founded the Congregation of Notre Dame in 1653, wasn't named until 1985, and the first and still only Francophone woman author is Gabrielle Roy, who was designated in 2008. So there are now close to 650 persons of national historic significance on the Parks Canada website, about 100 of whom can be described as writers. A number are not designated specifically for their literary activity. For example, Nellie McClung. Her citation describes her as a politician, a feminist, a social activist, and the first female board member of the CBC. She also wrote a whole bunch of novels, so I consider her a writer for the purposes of this study. The same can be, true, can be said of several others. Jesse Archibald and E. Cora Hind also make the list for their, for their um, work for women's rights rather than for their writing. Even when such women are added to the list of authors, they barely raise the proportion of female names of writers to 20% perhaps not surprising in view of the paucity of women on the board. Some ethno-cultural imbalances in the representation of Canada's cultural history began to receive correction with the addition of Icelandic Canadian poet Stephen G. Stephenson in 1946, of many Aboriginal cultural and historic figures since the 1970s. Uh, early black writers were recognized with uh, Mary Ann Shad in 1994 and Mary and Henry Bibb in 2002. A.M. Klein was the first Jewish writer to be recognized in 2007. But the list of approved literary and cultural figures still favors men who are white, Christian, Anglophone or Francophone, and based in Eastern Canada. Thus, the list exemplifies the board's historic representation of an elite that has privileged its own storyline, in the words of historian Veronica Strongbog, who has served on the board. And is, I know her quite well. She's told me some of the stories of what goes on that you can't be repeated in public. But it's a struggle to, to adjust, to, to change the paradigm. In fact, my own recent experience, which I am going to talk about, ex uh, shows how the conservative evaluation criteria remain firmly in place. So I first became involved with the board in 2006 when I was consulted about the nomination of Mary Ann Sadlier, whose lengthy and prolific career as a Catholic novelist during the 19th century finally earned her recognition as a national historic person in 2008. Two years later, I was asked to review the, working, the wording on her plaque, which is to be placed in Old Montreal, the site once occupied by the Sadler Publishing Company. It, it, I don't know when and where they're going to do it. <coughs> I haven't heard. I'd like to know, actually. I'd like to go see it. More direct participation ensued when I, was, when I attended a women's history workshop in Vancouver, here in Vancouver, in February 2008. This was organized by UBC historian Jean Barman, wonderful person, and sponsored by Parks Canada. The purpose of this workshop, which included a lot of people uh, in the vicinity, 
although the, uh, and flew some people in from Alberta and um, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, mostly historians. I think I was the only literary person there. But the, the purpose was to generate more uh, stronger female presence um, among the names recognized by the HSNBC, particularly from the West. So I had no trouble thinking of of people I thought were worthy of designation. I numbered, I, and I actually nominated five Western women writers. But some of them was quite easy because they were already, there was a lot of material I could just you know, collect and submit and say, hey, look, this person's worthy of recognition. These were um, Marie Jose, who's a labor poet, Vancouver writer Isabel Ecclestone Mackay. She wrote fiction and poetry and plays, and she was very prominent here in the 1920s. Florence Randall Livesey, the author of mother, uh, the mother, sorry, of poet Dorothy Livesey. Florence was also a writer. Um, travel writer Agnes Deans Cameron, who wrote one of the first uh, very important travel books about the North, and novelist Ethel Wilson. In the end, only Ethel Wilson was deemed to, quote, meet the benchmark set by other literary, literary figures recognized for their national historic significance, such as Ellen Montgomery. That's a quotation from the minutes of the board. Given Wilson's sophisticated literary taste, I can't help wondering what she would think of this comparison to Ella Montgomery, whom she probably disdained completely as a popular writer. She's probably rolling in her grave right now as we speak. In any case, the, rec the recommended site for her plaque is the Kensington Place apartment building, 1386 Nicola, where the Wilsons lived in a third floor apartment from 1943 to 1965. And that's when Ethel wrote um, most of her books. And there are already historic plaques on this building. It's it, uh, from Vancouver Heritage, um, uh, Heritage Plaques in the City of Vancouver. It, it's, uh, and um, if you look up, this I got off a real estate um, site. And I think it's about a million dollars a square foot right now. It's been, <laughs> it's been restored to a, quite an amazing uh, building. It was pretty nice when the Wilsons lived there, too. They weren't short of money. Her husband was a doctor. So there are two stages to the board's reviewing process both which involve the very hardworking and dedicated historians who work for Parks Canada. One of the wonderful things about having a PhD in history is you can work as an historian for Parks Canada and museums and continue to do research, things that you can't do with a PhD in English as easily. But um, it's one of the things I've learned when I was in the process of doing this research. All nominees, and nom nominations can come from anyone in the pub, anywhere. Anybody can submit a nomination. All nominees receive a preliminary screening. By, um, by, um, by historians at Parks Canada, and those deemed potential candidates for the designation of National Historic Person then proceed to a more detailed investigation, written up in a report that is, is presented at the meeting of the board. The board, I think, meets, meets approximately annually. So as nominator, I received signed copies of the board's full reports on the three names recommended for serious consideration, Florence Randall Livesey, Agnes Deans Cameron, and Ethel Wilson, as well as the anonymous, anonymous Anonymous, anonymously, <laughs> the unsigned <laughs> written screening reports rejecting my other two nominees. It's interesting that the, the, ones, the, the positive ones are signed by the historians and the ones that reject your, your candidates are unsigned. You, ne you never know who writes them. Um, okay. um, the, um, so the t and the text of these reports are really interesting because they illuminate the board's criteria and procedures. So the task of the historians, and I, and I actually know at least one of, these, one of the people who's worked there, and she's talked to me about this. Their, their role is to build the case that will meet the board's criteria for significance. And they do it by noting um, resemblances to previously designated figures, the way Wilson was compared to Montgomery. I knew that Marie, Marie Jusset was a long shot, but I hoped that her case would be carried by her identity as Canada's first female labor poet. However, as almost everything about Jusset is stuff that I've written, and they couldn't find much else to substantiate her case, she went by the wayside. Um, and in fact, the report that rejected her said, the HSNBC has recommended the designation of a relatively small number of poets, and it found recognition of Jusay as a poet, lacking in comparison with her selected peers, who were the big names of Robert Lampman Scott and Scott and Pauline Johnson. Um, I was more surprised by the um, rejections of Isabel Ecclestone Mackay and Agnes Deans Cameron because they had entries in the Dictionary of Canadian Biography, and I naively assumed that any woman who was worthy of a entry in the Dictionary of Canadian Biography was also worthy of recognition by the Historic Sites and Monuments Board. And by the way, only about 5% of the names in the Dictionary of Canadian Biography are female. So you know you have to be pretty visible to get in. But Mackay's nomination was turned down because the reviewer could not find sufficient scholarly material to testify to her significance. For example, Mackay had not been the subject of a PhD thesis. 
there's one waiting, there's a topic waiting for somebody. Um, however, reading between the lines of this report, when I reread it, I thought there's something going on here. Because the anonymous historian who wrote it brought in several other writers who are also not yet recognized for comparative purposes, namely Agnes Malmacar and Marjorie Pixall. And I thought, wait a minute, I think I'm being asked to submit those names because their cases can be made. And so, uh, those, and so I have made those, those um, recommendations. And so here are my three nominees that, who are currently in process. Uh, Marjorie Pixall, Agnes Malmacar, and Sarah Jeanette Duncan, because I couldn't imagine Sarah Je Je Jeanette Duncan not being there. So all three of them have passed the initial screening, and now they've gone on to further scrutiny. So the reports I get on them will be signed, whether or not they do succeed. And um, the next meeting of the HSNBC, I think, is scheduled for July 2012, and we'll find out then whether these three writers make the grade. OK, I want to talk just briefly about houses. So in addition to overseeing the approval of National Historic Persons, the HSNBC designa designates National Historic Sites. Well, writers as a group have received a good share of federal plaques as persons, and the HSNBC has clear policies for approving sites associated with historic persons. There are very few sites associated with writers. If you go on the Parks Canada website, you'll find over 950 historic sites in Canada. 167 of these are administered directly by Parks Canada, and the remainder are managed or are owned by other levels of government or by private entities. Yet only eight National Historic Sites are associated with writers, five with women. These five are Chiefswood, the Ontario birthplace of Pauline Johnson, <coughs> um, Emily Carr House in Victoria, where she was born, um, um, Maison Gabriel in St. Boniface, and the two for Ella Montgomery, um, Lise Dale Mance that I showed you earlier, and the uh, generalized and real the generalized real and imaginary landscape of Ella Montgomery's Cavendish at Prince Edward Island National Park. So although male writers vastly outnumber women as nationally historic persons, the homes of few have been recognized as national historic sites. Really, rather, I mean, it's not a big sample, but it's still an interesting contrast. The ones that are recognized are the birthplace of John McRae in Guelph, John McRae, author of In Flanders Fields, the residence of Ralph Connor in Winnipeg. Ralph Connor wrote his, uh, popular novels around the turn of the century, and Stephen Leacock's mansion in Orillia, Ontario. Um, <coughs> moreover, I don't know if it's a real mansion. I got Karen. Made, Karen took these, this photo and the next one, and she she was actually there. But it's pretty. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's more than a cabin. Um, <laughs> um, so the women's houses, um, so the, and there's a somewhat different pattern of recognition. The women's houses tend to be personal shrines, reconstructing the material conditions in which the writer lived or her literary creation, in the case of Green Gables. In comparison, while the museum homes of the men contain some artifacts from the author's life and career, the buildings tend to function more as public sites for events and education. For example, the stately Ralph Connor House, now owned by the Friends of the Ralph Connor House, has long been occupied by, the, by Winnipeg's University Women's Club. They actually bought the derelict building. It was going to be demolished. They bought it in 1939 and restored it and operated as a venue for educational and community gatherings. And they don't have very many artifacts from Ralph Connor. The more modest McRae House in Guelph, now owned and operated by Guelph Museums, this is, it's a civic, civically managed site, displays more artifact, artifacts and information about the First World War than about the poet and his family. This distinction isn't absolute. Emily Carr House in Victoria contains none of Carr's paintings or manuscripts, um, and, it, and it so it tends to follow the masculine pa pattern and holds frequent exhibitions of other painters. And the Leacock Museum is closer to the personal model, um, the feminine model, because it houses um, Leacock's archive of books and manuscripts and uh, personal papers. Um, so, given the number of Canadian writers designated as nationally important persons, why have so few of their homes been designated as national historic sites? Well, first of all, many of them no longer exist. Certainly, urban residences in, um, uh, in downtown, you know, downtown urban residences in places like Ottawa and Montreal, where there's been vast urban renewal, ended up demolishing an awful lot of residential um, um, buildings, and including a lot of houses where writers grew up. But the other problem is that money and dedication are required to maintain old buildings and turn them into museums. So while a lot of extant writers' houses are identified as such on provincial and national historic registers, only, um, they've only been noted and not restored. Uh, but some writers' advocates are very active. For example, the designation of Gabriel Roy as a national historic person and her birthplace in, in St. Boniface as a national historic site, which I showed you earlier, 
Both occurred in 2008, the very year they qualified, 25 years after her death in 1983. And it's likely that um, a similar fate is underway for Margaret Lawrence's house who, uh, in, in Nipoa, her childhood home in Nipoa. Uh, she died in 1989, and I'm sure that she's going to receive the designations as well. And there are a number of writers' homes that function as provincially supported museums without being nationally designated. There's Halliburton House in Windsor, Nova Scotia, which is provincially administered, Stephenson House in Alberta, and in Quebec, there are also a few writers' houses uh, that are cultural sites. So just to conclude, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to give Robert Croach the last word. <coughs> Museums, houses, and plaques uh, inflect historical consciousness by extending a writer's material presence from the bookshelf to the landscape. Critics often cite Robert Croach's dictum about the importance of creativity in constructing Can Canadian self-awareness. Quote, in a sense, we haven't got an, ident an identity until somebody tells our story. The fiction makes us real. This notion, I think, also applies to those who make the fictions and to the recognition they receive in our national historic narrative. So whether prompted by scholars and bureaucrats on the boards of national agencies, or by fans clamoring to visit the supposed residence of a fictional heroine, the material commemoration of Canada's writers tells important stories about how we per perceive and preserve our cultural history in relation to our current notions of who and what we are. Thank you. Thank you. More questions, please. If anybody's interested in, make, in, in presenting a nomination, I'd certainly be happy to advise you, by the way. Uh, thank you very much. That was very interesting indeed. Can you tell me more about uh, the ex what what the, the Heritage Board means by national? And I'm I'm concerned about the word national, and I'm concerned about the role of writers from Quebec in, in writing in French, and what's being done in Quebec. I'm not sure what they mean. I think they make it up as they go along. I mean, national changes so much, and I mean. I one would have to have a look at the minutes to actually see what goes on there. Um, I, think it's pr I think it's pretty loosely applied, because in fact, many of the writers are of much more regional significance than national significance. But I've, what they look for is recognition in dictionaries, in, in scholarly venues. Um, I actually surmise, and perhaps other people in this room would have something to say about it, that the reason why there aren't as many people from Quebec who are part of that process is choice. Um, it's not the board that's saying we don't want more francophones. It's that um, significance in a pan-Canadian context is less significance is less important than significance in a Quebecois context. And if you poke around on the web, there's masses. Uh, there are masses of, of um, historic sites and um, cultural things going on that are very Quebecois focused, supported by the provincial government. What was interesting, though, I can't remember which one it was. There are some sites. There was one, oh, one writer's house, I, I have to find in my notes, that is um, where they list, with, that gets a lot of federal funding in Quebec. If you, go on, if you go look at the board of sponsors, you'll see that it gets money from Heritage Canada, but it's not designated a national historic site. And so I think there's certain negotiations being played out about how, how the term national is used, because it, it, is such a, it can be such a fraught term. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's any discrimination at that level from the board. I think partly because their whole their historic consciousness was largely shaped by the history of New France. And uh, the, among the earlier designated figures are you know, many, many historical men from New France. The women have just generally had a rougher time because that's the fate of women in historical narrative. Does that answer your question or, uh, or assuage your concern? Well, I, I, I was concerned of being part of both. Uh, Western writers as well. I mean, I was interested in yeah. that, but I was also interested in Western writers and whether or not a writer from British Columbia was was a priori less likely to be considered national than a writer from Ontario. That that I mean that is interesting, and and Ethel Wilson's an interesting case because her she's very Van, she's very BC focused. Her books are set in BC. Um, people in Ontario don't pay that much attention to her. Um, and so, yeah, it, it can be a bit of an issue. Um, now, the representation on the board is regionally um, managed. So there are representatives from various reasons, yet from various regions. And so the West should be properly rec recognized. The other thing is, of course, history is shorter in the West. So there's less to draw on. Um, but um, I think there's all, there are also cultural differences. I mean, 
In Toronto, there are plaques in, all over the place from the city, from the province, as well as federally. In New Brunswick, you, you know, every time you turn around, you bump into a plaque in Fredericton, um, partly because they haven't torn anything down, so there's lots more to plaque, or they haven't torn much down. Who said, you know, I mean, where is our provincial board to recognize historical sites? Where is, um, this, the city of Vancouver has a heritage board, but it's mostly for buildings. I don't think it's for persons and other things. So I think some of it has to do with the local awareness and sense of the significance of recognizing um, the past in, in, you know, on site. And m maybe more has to be done at the local level um, as well as at the national level. Um, I'm wondering, Carol, but uh, presumably all the minutes and records of this group are available for... Uh, yeah, I think they are. I just haven't, I haven't, done, I haven't gone there. <laughs> no, I know. It would be a huge yeah. project, but what a fascinating project it would be to yeah. see over time how these yes, yes. criteria shifted. And in fact, um, there's the book by C.J. Taylor, but he's focusing more on um, sort of the management side of things. And, and, it, because it, and he's not looking at the cultural figures. The cultural figures tend to be sort of on the sideline. Yes, no, I know that if I'm to do a lot more with this, I've got to book some time to plow through archives in Ottawa. And um, so uh, that, that's where stories are told. But of course, official minutes and actual conversations can be very divergent. And, um, and so the times when I've actually been, you know, when I've talked to people who've been on the board recently, uh, um, I mean, they, as I said, they've told me stories about conflicts. Um, I mean, the, the designation of Mary Ann Sadler ran into all sorts of things. You know, how, how, you know, in which way is she significant? In what way is she nationally significant? In fact, she spent a lot of her life in the States because the, um, in the Anglo-Irish Catholic community, there was the, the line of cultural line was, was um, um, Montreal, Boston. And the family newspapers were in Boston as well as Montreal. And so the issue there was, is she Canadian enough to be recognized? Um, I mean, she wrote enough. She wrote at least 60 novels. Uh, and they were incredibly in influential and popular. Um, so there's an awful lot of, there's an awful lot to be negotiated. It'd be re really interesting to um, be a fly on the wall in some of those conversations. But yes, there, there's more archival work to be done. And I've been avoiding the dirty stuff. I've been spending more time with the fun stuff. I could just, just ask a sort of a follow-up question, or maybe I'm just being selfish in asking a second question, but uh, it, this 25, I'm wondering what you think about the 25 year rule. Like I understand it because yeah. you want to wait some time presumably to decide whether somebody's reputation has yes, some yeah. lasting value. But then I'm thinking, you know, when you talk about a country with a recent history and how quickly development happens in urban contexts, like something like Joy Kagawa's house, uh, which is, I would think is pretty obviously going to have long term significance, but uh, if you have to wait until she dies, and then 25 years later hope that that house would still be there, I mean that's obviously a yeah. A well, that and that's why it's really interesting to um, putter around on the web and see how many, how many dedicated local groups there are. You know who? I mean the the campaign to preserve Joy Kagawa's house was quite visible here a few years ago. They had to raise. Um, thank God they did it a few years ago. You know when it was worth a little less, and it's probably worth now. Um, but they had to raise a lot of money, um, and it was it was you know, quite a a visible campaign. The same thing with Alperti's um, shack. Uh, and also, these are houses that are not very well built. They're fairly, you know, they're wooden structures. They're not going to last for long unless people really do preserve them. But um, there, are, there are local groups all over the place who've taken it upon themselves to preserve houses. And the, and the, the question of what kind of designations to get, I, another thing I haven't researched thoroughly, um, but people in the museums will know more about is, what benefits you get from what stage of designation. And so being on a provincial or national register presumably at least gives you some recognition. Um, but I know that um, from talking to people in New Brunswick, which is where there are so many of these places, people are desperate because these houses are falling apart. And in order to apply for national designation, I think they have to promise to make certain um, you know, upgrades. And there has, there has to be some, some basis to support it. The advantage uh, for these, and I, cause I, I uh, was in some email communication with the people at Ralph Connor House and at um, uh, the Mackay House, um, um, that, uh, what's the name in Guelph, um, in Flanders Fields, um, McRae, thank you. Uh, and they said the advantage to them was that it did make them eligible for grants to upgrade the buildings, but they had to fulfill criteria that required a certain um, investment in the first place. You have to have a, 
a viable building in order to get an upgrade. If your building's about to fall apart, you know, you, you, you're not going to you're not going to get bailed out. So there are a lot of people who are struggling to to manage these things, and and I, I assume that I mean because of these things are dispersed regionally, um, provincially and municipally, um, you know, the resources are are different in different places. Um, but the dedication of specific people is quite amazing, and with with the least Dale Mance, uh, all the um, apparently the the group of women who were determined to get. That, ho that home of El Montgomery's designated National Historic Site, their efforts are legendary. Um, because uh, Montgomery already had a National Historic Site in Pinsewood Island, so why, you know, why, why Ontario? And um, apparently their efforts were superhuman and they actually you know, were able to make their case. So, yeah, it takes hard work. Another question? If not, let us thank our speaker once more. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>